Dave up. Well, we pray for David as he um, reads your word, as he speaks to us. Lord, I thank you for this time we've had with you. And I pray that this will continue, Lord, that the words that he brings, Lord, will be <laughs> confirming and you know, just speaking the words that you've already been speaking over us, Lord. I pray for your word to bring life, to bring fruit. I pray for this time to be a blessing. Bless Dave as he preaches as well, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, can we turn in our Bibles to Luke 21, verse 5 to 28? That would be great. Thank you for the words that everyone brought this morning, st stepping out. And Gina summarized very nicely about Jesus calling us back to him today. I've heard words about, about wheat growing. When you plant the seed, it takes a long time for it to grow. Remember to pick up your chili plant on the way out. We're trying to get rid of those by the front door. You plant the seed, it takes a while for that chili to be produced. It takes perseverance, patience. Charlotte reminded us about standing firm. And so this morning, really what I wanted to, the, the passage, there's some quite heavy stuff in this passage this morning. And really what I want you to take away from today is persevere, keep going, get your eyes on to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I find life, it's, it's full of many journeys, and to complete the journeys, you've got to keep your eyes on the prize. Just think of a few journeys in my life. One, my dad took me up the tallest mountain in Northern Ireland called Mount Donard, and it was a tough walk. I had a fall on the way up, hurt myself, and it was quite a minor injury, but I was very young at the time. But I wanted to you know, give up, and the, the, the bit at the end is really steep and much easier just to go back. It's like, no, no, it's persevere. The prize is you get to say, I've, I've got to the top of the mountain. I've made a phone call on on my dad's friend's mobile phone, which is a novelty back then. And I got to look across a beautiful view. That was the prize. I left Northern Ireland when I was 18 to go to Wales with a prize in my, my view that I wanted to get my de degree in optometry. I remember the night before I left, I was really upset, I cried, and I'm not a crying guy, but I cried the night before I left because I was upset, leaving my family, leaving the shelter, leaving everything that I knew, but there was a prize at the end. I wanted the prize. So I left. Things didn't always go so well. I got a bit distracted. I didn't work so hard. I started to fail. I phoned my mother one night and I said to her, I want to quit. And my mom, with great wisdom, got me this uh, flight home, I think the very night or the next day. 20 odd years ago, I can't quite remember perfectly, but uh, she got me home and my mum and dad didn't say a word to me I just, about, about quitting. I just said, I'm quitting. And in that time, and perhaps this is for us today to recalibrate, in that time, back at that weekend, sitting on my mother's couch, I remembered what I was there for. My eyes went back to the prize. I'm not going to fail. I'm going to go back and I'm going to fight for this. And guys, the Christian walk is difficult. That's why it was good to hear from Charlotte about standing firm. I was uh, prayer walking with a pastor in another church in another town three weeks ago, or two or three weeks ago. And he said to me, if only someone had told him how difficult it is. You know, to follow Jesus and to do what Jesus has called you to do, which for him was lead this church. And he said to me, David, seven times in the last three years, I have seriously considered quitting, packing it in. The reason he keeps going is because he recalibrates and he sees the prize. He sees Jesus. He sees the reward for faithful service to him. So this morning, I want to I wanna push us back to Jesus. There's some heavy stuff in here. I want to read a little bit, comment a little bit, read a little bit, comment a little bit. So here we go. So Luke 21, 5. While some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. 
Jesus is leaving the temple for the very last time in his earthly ministry. He loves this temple. It, he refers to it as his father's house. And my father's house is to be a, a house of prayer for all nations. And as he's leaving it, his disciples are admiring this piece of architectural beauty. And they had every right to admire it. This was a spectacular building. The most spectacular building in Bury St. Edmunds, maybe the cathedral, maybe St. Mary's, maybe kegs. I don't know. But this building was amazing. Josephus tells us, Josephus tells us that the stones that made up this building, marble stones, some of them were 11 meters long. 11 meters. I'm 1.78 meters. I looked it up for sake of illustration today. Picture five times my length and a bit. 11 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters. Spectacular. The east side of the temple was plated with gold so that when light shone on it, it was seen for miles upon miles upon miles. This was spectacular. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. 11 by 5 by 3. <laughs> 11 by 5 by 3. 40 years after Jesus echoed these words, 15 years roughly after Luke wrote them, the Roman governor, or sorry, General Tertius, put scaffolding all around this temple and burned it. Burned it so that the massive stones crumbled and there was not left one stone upon another. Jesus' words always proved to be true. This would have been shocking to the disciples. The immovable temple, it's always there. It's always there, seen for miles upon miles upon miles upon miles. And I've been thinking about this, just reminding myself just the thoughts I was thinking around the time where the pandemic kicked in. And a lot of what I always built my life upon, the immovable things that were always there and never failed me, all of a sudden, I realized this is, this is sand. <laughs> Jesus says, you build your life upon anything other than him and his word, you're building upon sand. And one of the things that, by the grace of God, we've always had was I always had a good job with a good income. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I had no customers. <laughs> I have no income, <laughs> potentially. It's like, I thought this was immovable. It's not immovable. It's not immovable. I was driving home from um, actually David's funeral in London in January on the A14, 70 miles an hour, keeping to the speed limit. And something that I've always trusted and built my life on when I'm driving an A14 is my four wheels in the car. Immovable. Never let me down. My rear passenger wheel, the tire burst at 70 miles an hour. I started losing control of the vehicle. <laughs> By the grace of God, I managed to get into a lay-by and I didn't die. But these things that were immovable, they're, they're movable. I want us to recalibrate and look at Jesus, the only one that will never let us down. The only one that's worth building everything upon. So they then, these disciples in here, that, that, what, the temple's going to be destroyed. But Jesus, surely you're coming to overthrow Rome and bring the kingdom back to Israel. So they ask a question to Jesus. They want some clarification. They said, teacher, when will these things be? What will be the sign when these things are about to take place? So they're admiring everything. Jesus says, hey, it's not going to last forever. It's going to be destroyed. And they're like, hey, when is this going to happen? And Jesus is going to answer the question. But before he answers the question, he tells us what they need to hear and what we need to hear. And this is what he says. See that you are not led astray. See that you are not led astray. And that is my heart for you all this morning. See that you are not led astray. Now, I told you about my little story about going to Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland to Wales. And when I arrived in, in Wales, I was put into this flat with five young men, 18, 19, 20 years of age, who really knew how to sin. They 
taught me about debauchery. They taught me about, I don't know why they say Irish people drink a lot. Because when I moved there, like, oh my goodness, these guys just drink and drink and drink and drink. They taught me about drugs. They taught me about a very immoral lifestyle. And I remember within the first couple of days, they, they took me for a tour. We went upstairs and there were some girls in the, in the uh, flat above. So they went to introduce themselves to the girls. And I was terrified of girls. <laughs> I couldn't talk to them. I was so shy. I just, st I'm still a bit scared of them, actually. I just <laughs> stood, stood there while they were all showing off and being very, very rude. And one of the girls turned to me, and I remember her just saying to me, you seem a little bit different to them. Don't let them lead you astray. Don't let them turn you into them because they are not good. <laughs> they are not good people. Don't be led astray. I remember that so well. I remember what she looks like. She probably can't remember saying it to me. But Jesus says that to his disciples. And I'm saying that to you today. Don't be led astray. Don't be led astray. And this is where you're going to hear some pretty tough stuff. He says, don't be led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not Go after them. And Jesus is always right. Many do come in his name and lead people away from him. We have got Mormonism. We have got Islam, led by the ministry of the false prophet Muhammad. And that might sound really controversial to say that, and you can get in serious trouble for saying that sort of thing. But the reality of it is, if you speak to our Muslim friends, my brother is a Muslim. So I don't dislike Muslims. I love Muslims. I try and witness to them all the time. But the reality of it is that that ministry takes people away from the Savior. We need a Savior, not a religion. If we're falling out of a plane, religion is we try and flap our wings to save ourselves. Our arms. <laughs> but... Jesus is putting on a parachute. We put our trust in Jesus and he saves us. Many will come in my name and deceive people. Many false teachers in my name, many come in, many will come in my name, not just one or two, many will come in my name, in my name, and they're going to lead people astray. There are many preachers of the gospel, and I say this to you guys now because we live in an age where you can access any sermon from this sermon that I'm preaching today could probably be, could be accessed on the other side of the world. I mean, it probably won't be. I'm not famous. But there are sermons that you can access from any part of the world. And a lot of them tickle our ears. They make us go, oh, wow, if we follow Jesus, I'm not going to get sick. If we follow Jesus, I'm going to have an awesome marriage. If I follow Jesus, I'm going to have lots of money, and I'm never going to have difficulty paying my bills. That is a false gospel. But I hear, I've heard that so many times. It's a false gospel. And it takes us away from the Savior. All of a sudden, our eyes are off Jesus, and we're like, what Jesus can give us on the earth it takes us away. Do not be led astray, Jesus said. Many will come in my name. Do not be led astray. And this is, this is tough here. Do not be led astray when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. And I'll confess, it can be scary whenever you see what's going on in the world. When you hear Putin and Russia saying, if NATO give fighter jets to Ukraine, there'll be serious, deadly consequences. It's easy to be terrified. When you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. These things must take place, but the end will not be at once. He said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Just in the, over this last century, or the 1900s and the 2000s, we've had World War I. You know, 6% of the British adult population of men 
were killed in World War I. Six percent. World War II, 50 to 56 million people died in war. And we've got the war in Ukraine at the moment. And our, our friend Jenya, who's living with us, she's actually traveling back from Ukraine at the minute. She knows young men who have died in this war. Don't be led astray when you hear about these wars. Don't be led astray because there will be great earthquakes. 59,259 people died in the Turkey-Syria earthquake, which has just happened. Do not be led astray, because in various places there will be famines and pestilences. That's disease. Seven million died of COVID. It's just happened. There will be terrors and create signs in heaven. You can see why this, I said there's some heavy stuff in here. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Do not be led astray, because before all this, they're going to lay hands on you and they're going to persecute you. You see how this is so different to those sermons that tickle your ears and say you're going to be rich and everything's going to be great in this Christian walk? I want to tell you that Jesus promised something. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but I have conquered the world. They will lay your hands on you and persecute you. They'll deliver you up to synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. I will give you a mouth and wisdom. None of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. And by your endurance, Charlotte's word, standing firm, you will gain your lives. Now this is not what we're seeing in the UK at the minute. When people say that we're persecuted here, we're really not. We're really not persecuted here. You may have the odd problem in a workplace but really we're not driving through this village in Odisha I've shared this before for some of you apologies for sharing it again I was beside this guy called Johnson I don't know how that's an Indian name but it was and Johnson said to me in this village we were going through it was a small village nine of our brothers and sisters were executed for their faith in Jesus now that hits home when you're with somebody who knows someone, and you can see the tears in his eyes. For us, it's like so far away that it's hard to even put ourselves in that, those shoes. That's happening right now. Just in the, in the UK, we don't see that. In North Korea, children, um, parents often have to hide their faith from their children in case it slips out at school and the children get taken away. Almost every Islamic country, I don't think Islam's a religion of peace, Christians are persecuted. And Edward and Elizabeth told me that there's only four movements of churches in the UK that are not in decline. And I haven't actually verified this, but I trust Edward and Elizabeth, so I'll tell you what they are. It's New Frontiers, Vineyard, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, and Elam Pentecostal. All the other ones are in decline. And I guess I'm a little concerned that as I see the mainstream churches, which my dear Auntie Jean would be really upset to see what's happening in her movement, as the mainstream churches go from this relationship with the Word of God to what I see as this relationship with the Word of God, things could heat up for us as we lose a bit of covering. In all that, what I want to say to you, because I actually love you all, do not be led astray. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Not a hair of your head will perish. So what do you do knowing that all these things are happening, all these pains and sufferings, and the Bible says these are like birth pains. These are birth pains. Whenever a lady gives birth, 
she experiences pain, contractions. <laughs> and then there might be an easing, and then more contractions, and then ultimately the birth. Jesus says that his return, there will be birth pains, of which famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, persecution of Christians, they are like birth pains leading up to the return of Christ. What do we do knowing that not a hair of our head will perish and all these difficult things are happening? Martin Luther, that's quite apt. We've got our little chili plants. Remember to get your chili plant before you leave. <laughs> Martin Luther was asked a question. He, said, he was asked, you may have heard this before, quite famous. He was asked, what would you do today if you knew the world would end tomorrow? And he said, I would plant a tree. I'd plant a tree. Planting a tree is about faith. You've got to be patient for that wheat to appear. You've got to be patient for that chili to appear. But planting a tree means we are trusting God and we're living by faith. So I want to encourage us today, eyes on Jesus, plant a tree. A few things I've put together. How do you plant a tree today? Well, we continue to worship God. We continue to pray and focus on Jesus. We continue to partner with other believers and build things for the kingdom of God, the hangout, the allotment, whatever we're doing. We teach the next generation about the goodness of God. We provide for the poor, we care for the widow and the orphan, we share the gospel and we stay faithful to God. We stay on the narrow path, Jesus said. Stay on the narrow path. In the midst of a world whose foundations will fail just like the temple was destroyed. By your endurance, you gain your lives. He says that at the end of the persecution. He talks about the persecution of believers. And I've just been thinking, because I've seen a lot of people give their lives to Jesus. Some of them go on. And, and it, with patience bear fruit, like a little wheat plant there. And I've seen a lot of people follow Jesus and then eyes off, off we go. I was thinking, what stops us enduring now? We haven't got an earthquake in the UK. No one's invaded our country. We are not severely and heavily persecuted, but many still don't endure in the UK. This is not an exhaustive list, but a few things I've been thinking of are whenever our eyes are off Jesus and they're on someone else. And this is an example from my childhood that I, again, I've shared this with some of you before, but we were brought up in my home, Presbyterians. We went to the Presbyterian church every Sunday. And um, uh, my, my, my father, I remember my father got, my father is not walking with the Lord at the moment, but my father uh, punished me for not going to the Christian Union. So... That's some change. And the change I see happening with him, and I do love my father. The Bible says, honor your parents. I've just learned a lesson here. And hopefully it will help you. There was this guy in, my, in the church. His name was Colin. And he was, he was a bigwig. He was, everyone loved Colin. He was a missionary into Africa. And really well thought of in the church. His parents were pillars of the church. And he encouraged my dad and my mom whenever they had struggles with doubt and things like that. He's just a great guy. My dad looked up to this guy. And uh, this same guy that did all these great things left his wife and four kids one week after his wife's sister died from cancer. I mean, come on. And this crushed my dad's faith. <laughs> this crushed it. And I'm thinking, perhaps his eyes had gone from Jesus to Colin. And I'm just going to say to you, because you guys are all looking at me at the moment, I don't want you to look at me. I want you to look at Jesus. Because I could let you down. I don't want to do what Colin did. But many a leader falls. And I really want to encourage you to look to Jesus Christ. He is good. 
He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never, ever let you down. Do not be led astray. Keep your eyes on him. And another thing that I think can take us off the path, a friend of mine who I led to the Lord is not following the Lord because he loves gambling more than Jesus. Love of sin can take us away. Love of sin can take us away. That's why it's been so good at our men's events. We're opening up and we're sharing where we're struggling because the reality of it is sin is deadly. Uh, I saw this debate, this guy called Dinesh Sousa. He's, a, he's an Indian uh, Christian apologist. And he's asked this question, why do young men and women fall away from God when they go to university? And he said, well, there's two possibilities. One is that Maybe they just get really educated and realize they don't need Jesus. But actually, the real truth is, being a Christian is not compatible with sin. And people love to sin. So if you've got sin in your lives that could be destroying you, confess it to your brother or sister. Hold each other accountable. And let's keep our eyes on Jesus. One of the saddest verses in the Bible that you will find is in 2 Timothy 4, 10. Well, you've got this guy called Demas. And if you read the end of Colossians, you find out that Demas sends his greeting to the church in Colossae. He is one of Paul's inner, inner gospel partners. We had Gavin preaching last week. He's one of my gospel partners. Ian and Gemma Lessington in Seven Oaks, gospel partners. Some of you guys, gospel partners. And it says here that Demas was in love with the present world, deserted him, and went to Thessalonica. Stay focused on Jesus. Help each other to stay focused on Jesus. If you're with a brother or a sister who confesses a sin to you, point them to the beauty of Jesus. Jesus is better than this. Jesus brings life. He'll never let you down. And then he comes back to the question about the temple. He tells us what we need to hear. Don't be led astray. And then he answers the question. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation has come near. How did this happen? How did this happen? Well, the, the uh, high priest put to death James, the apostle, illegally. Rome then removed the high priest. The zealots, the Jewish zealots, rise up against Rome, and then Rome comes in and crushes the place. A million Jews are killed. The temple is burnt to the ground. And Jesus gave this warning and said, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When you see it surrounded by armies, Get out of the city. When you see this happening, flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. Get out of there. Let those who are in the country do not come in, for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. A million Jews die. The Christians survive. Why do the Christians survive? Because whenever they see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, they remember what Jesus said and they flee to the mountains. They flee to the mountains. And whenever we see the things happening in this world that are happening right now, the birth pains, the wars, the rumors of wars, the persecution um, of Christians, earthquakes, disease, when we see these things happen in the same way that the, the people fled from the city to the mountains, we flee to Jesus. Eyes on him. Flee to him. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption, resurrection bodies, a home in heaven. Every tear will be wiped away. No ear is heard. No eye is seen. No enter the heart of man's imagination, the good things that God has prepared for those who love him. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not be led astray. Closing with Tim Keller's quote from Tim Keller. He passed, he passed away yesterday or a day before. He said this, If the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, and it did really happen, there's no other reason why the church would be here today in every nation of the world. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, then ultimately God is going to put everything right. Suffering is going to go away. Evil is going to go away. And death is going to go away. How good is that? How good is that? It's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Please, what I want you to hear today is don't be led astray. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Not to me, not to Norman, not to Andy, to Jesus. And guys, are we really great? Can I just pray for us? We stand, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have the Lord's Supper together. Oh, Lord some heavy things in here today. But Lord, you are such a good and kind God. And Father, I want to pray for every single brother here today and every single sister here today that Father, you would help us to keep our eyes on you, on Jesus. Take our eyes off the fleeting pleasures of sin which destroy And Father, let's not put men and women on pedestals because they'll fail us, Lord. (laughs) Let us look to you. I pray that every single brother and sister here will follow you all the way to heaven. And we thank you that you're in control of the suffering and pain in this world. And help us to trust you in that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we're going to come to the table. I think most of us know what this is. This is, a, this is a, a meal for Christians. We're going to have some bread. and We have the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. When we drink the wine, we remember the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus died for our sins so that we don't have to die for our sins. And as we come to the table, I want, you to, I want you to confess your sins before you come to God. And I want you to offer yourselves to God fully and say, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. So let's have a moment just of silence while we remember Jesus. And then we're going to have a little bit of worship. And then during the worship, come and have the bread.